I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. We will talk about some of the Northland Foundation programs that are helping children from low income families see a brighter future. A new solar garden project planned for Duluth will benefit local veterans and help families struggling to pay their energy bills. And we will talk with the director of the Independent Television Festival coming to Duluth this fall. These stories and the business news next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. This week's show was taped on Wednesday due to the Easter weekend. And now here's Denny with our first guest. All right. Thank you very much, Julie, and welcome, everyone. All this month, Almanac North is featuring efforts in our region to narrow the opportunity gap for young people growing up in poverty. Now, that's in conjunction with a national TV series airing on WDSE this month, which highlights efforts being made across the nation and right here in our region. Joining us now is Tony Sertich, president of the Northland Foundation. Tony, thank you very much for being here. Tony, address, if you will, through the perspective and eyes of the Northland Foundation, the problem that we have here in northeastern Minnesota and perhaps much of the Northland. Yeah, families are really challenged. Many families are really challenged in our region uh, who are experiencing poverty, being in low-wage jobs, having many barriers to find more meaningful employment. Uh, and really, these issues are not just about the children. In many instances, there are really family barriers that are in place uh, that uh, if, uh, uh, if set aside or if overcome are really helpful to the family and for the kids' futures. Mm -hmm. Now, you work across the, the region. We've heard a lot about the opportunity gap here in the Twin Ports, but mm -hmm. are there other communities that you see as being particularly hard hit in the Northland? Well, unfortunately, our entire region mm -hmm. uh, is seeing a challenge. Uh, and when you look across Minnesota, uh, we unfortunately have higher statistics of more families experiencing poverty and children as well. And one of the important factors is, and this is something that we know more today than we did even 10 or 20 years ago, is the development in children in those first years of life are so absolutely vital and can really tell a lot about their future, fortunately or unfortunately. And so getting at kids early and making sure that there are less barriers for their family, less stressors, and more opportunity is helpful in the long term. So then what are some of the needs that the children have in low-income families that perhaps are not getting addressed now? Well, some of them are just as basic as uh, people, are, people know that the more words that children hear or experience in the early uh, parts of their life, uh, the more ready they are for kindergarten and school and that development that's happening in a young person's mind. Well, if you're uh, in a family uh, who's working maybe two or three jobs uh, and aren't in a stable living environment, uh, that's going to be to the detriment of you ha having some of those developmental experiences that are going to be useful for you moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, the Northland Foundation's Kids Plus program has mm -hmm. been around since the 90s, mm -hmm. and the, the programs keep kind of morphing to deal with the issues at hand. Talk about the Early Childhood Initiative and, and how that kind of rose to the top of your programming. Yeah, what I love about the Northland Foundation is we're really responsive to communities' mm -hmm. needs. And so since the 1990s, as you said, uh, we, it was really identified in our communities and as the research was shown, the importance of investing in children mm -hmm. and really learning and understanding about children uh, at a younger and younger age. It's not just about kindergarten, it's about getting kids ready from birth. And so the Early Childhood Initiative really started uh, back then where across 12 communities in northeastern Minnesota bringing together, making sure they have the tools and resources so they can go back to their communities and get the best new learning about child development that's possible. Mm -hmm. So there are coalitions working in these communities? There are coalitions and we still meet to this day with a, a coordinator from that community and we bring those coordinators across the region together because sometimes it can feel lonely if you're sitting in a small rural community trying to figure this out uh, with your coalition. Uh, you can get to a larger table and sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll bring in national speakers and other folks mm -hmm. to make sure that folks are getting the training and the resources they need so that they can deliver even better high quality early childhood education mm -hmm. to kids sure. all across northeastern per Minnesota. Perhaps not only physical needs have to be met for these children, 
Are there mental health issues too that have to be need, uh, have to be met? Absolutely, and that's where we got the most learning of around child development and development of the brain. Those social and emotional needs in a young child that are taking place from birth until six, seven, eight years old. And so uh, we've started a Thrive Initiative in partnership with Essentia Health Foundation and others. Really, once again, bringing those resources to those people that are working with children across the board, making sure that uh, they know about the resources that are available, whether it's at-home visitations, whether it is, uh, we know that 60% of the kids that are living in the Central Hillside neighborhood in Duluth are experiencing poverty today. And so uh, Molly Harney, who's a doctor up at uh, UMD, uh, she's really looked at that neighborhood yeah. and what are some of the barriers and challenges so that we know firsthand what these families are experiencing, that they can be better served. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any um, tangible or quantifiable results from the initiatives that the Northland Foundation is doing as they relate to children and the opportunity gap? Well, certainly we're hearing from uh -huh. families, we're hearing from those that are providing teachers and others uh, that these investments are needed and they're in short supply because our, our, some of our systems aren't set up for our youngest uh, children right now. And so we're hearing that if not for some of these resources, not, not just from us, but from our partners as well, uh, these sort of services wouldn't be provided. You also have intergenerational programs, age to age. What's that all about, Tony? That's very helpful that once again, research has shown that having loving, caring adults in children's lives are, are very helpful to their development. And so, but we also know from, uh, from an aging perspective, our elders and senior citizens in our community are feeling more and more isolated as, as they age. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with demographic shifts. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, not anymore. Families are kind of living all in our region. Sometimes uh, you'll have seniors or elders living in the community and their kids are gone and their grandkids are gone and they're feeling more isolated. So our H to H program is really going into community and helping them uh, develop some programming or initiatives or an idea that's bringing together our youngest children our elders and seniors and all ages in between to really focus on efforts in their mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for us as a region to have this conversation about the opportunity gap, particularly at this point in time? Unfortunately, our poverty levels are high and that is really a detriment to families, detriment to our kids, and as I said, really puts in place barriers for their development and their likelihood of success as adults moving forward. Uh, and these are issues that are really core bread and butter issues that we need to address. Mm -hmm. And so focusing on this is gonna better our economy, have healthier communities, and have better outcomes for student success. And Tony, with that, we have to stop. Tony Sertich, president of the Northland Foundation. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be here, thank, thank you. you. Duluth's Lincoln Park continues to see major changes with more on the way. Reconstruction of the Interstate 35 and Highway 53 so-called can of worms interchange will begin in 2020. But even before that, a silver garden is being planned for the neighborhood that will benefit local veterans and help families struggling to pay their energy bills. Here to tell us more is Jody Slick, CEO of Ecolibrium 3, which is raising funds for the solar array. And Katie Fry is Supervisor of Customer Programs and Services at Minnesota Power. And thanks to both of you for being here. And Katie, I'd like to start with you because um, some people might not be familiar with the term solar garden. So can you just kind of lay it out for us in terms of what we're talking about when we say that Lincoln Park might get a solar garden? Sure, that's a great, great question. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different terms, or a lot of different ways that folks are using the term solar garden. Minnesota Power has a solar garden program that's available for customers, uh, where customers can actually subscribe into the program and get a portion of solar without having to install it on their own home. Mm -hmm. um, this program is a little bit different um, in that it just allows the community to participate in a solar array. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jody, another term that uh, people may not be familiar with, pe people my age maybe, <laughs> uh, sustainable future. <laughs> what is a sustainable future? Well, I think when we talk about sustainability, we're often talking about how we meet um, the needs of our current population, 
uh, well ensuring that we can meet the needs of future populations. So, and so we can think about things like uh, climate change and reducing the amount of carbon we're putting in the atmosphere is going to make it better for future generations because right now we're making it worse for future generations. Mm -hmm. And so things like clean energy um, and in, in this particular case where you're able to build a solar array that will be there for 25 plus years, mm -hmm. you're really building an asset that can help the community for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. okay. Now your organization, Ecolibrium 3, has been working in the Lincoln Park neighborhood for a number of years now and working with renewable energy and energy efficiency. Why, why is a solar garden and solar energy a really good fit for that community? Sure, uh, you know, Equilibrium 3, we always talk about, operates at this intersection mm -hmm. of energy, equity, and economic vitality. And what we love about um, this particular solar array is it's gonna sit at the entrance to the Lincoln Park neighborhood. Um, and the power that comes from it will be helping low-income households. Uh, some power will go to the Duluth Veterans Place mm -hmm. and help on their transitional housing um, program for homeless veterans. And then the rest of the power will actually create an emergency energy fund that over the 25 plus years of the ray will probably help about 500 households mm -hmm. um, and keep them from potentially having their utilities disconnected. And when we think about what's important for neighborhoods, um, when you lose your utilities, that can actually cause your house to be condemned for human habitation. So we're taking people that are already facing some sort of financial crisis and, and causing even more issues um, because they may need to move out of their house and that can create blight. And so all of the work that we do in the neighborhood is where can we come up with solutions um, that have multiple co-benefits. And so this is a great way to create an, an asset and a welcoming entrance yeah. to the neighborhood uh, as we're doing things like working on energy poverty and clean energy. So is solar energy the energy of the future or is that one of perhaps a mix? Well, uh, you know, Minnesota Power has a, a uh, energy forward plan and so as they talk about the large grid issues, um, they have a, a number of things that are in their mix. When we think about what's possible at a neighborhood or uh -huh. a household level, um, really solar energy is the solution that we have. And, and a lot of people uh, think that because it's, they, they feel like it's windy up here, maybe we should be more wind in this community. And you have a cloudy day, so they don't think that we should have sun. <laughs> um, but we actually have as much kind of solar energy potential as like Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and so for households and, and neighborhoods, it is solar. Rooftop mm -hmm. solar energy, Katie, is that perhaps one of the things Minnesota Power is seriously looking at? Sure, Minnesota Power has had a rebate program in place for um, rooftop solar and supporting our customers in their choices since 2004. So we've got a pretty robust solar sense program that helps customers through that if that's the choice they want to make. Mm -hmm. And are you finding uh, <coughs> that solar is really working well in this in this region? Because as Jody mentioned, some people are a little bit skeptical with our climate that this is uh, the right fit for northern Minnesota. Yeah, you know, we get a lot of questions from our customers on you know, do I have to shovel the snow off all the time? <laughs> and, and it really, it does. It works a lot better than folks kind of initially anticipate. And we see a lot of cust our customers who are very happy with going solar on their house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jody, uh, I understand you held a solar design event earlier this week. And I saw some pictures and it looked <laughs> like there were some pretty creative things that were being generated. We've got some photos from that. Maybe you can talk about what that activity was like and what some of the ideas were that emerged out of it. Sure, we often use the idea of uh, design thinking and this mm -hmm. is one of our first uh, crafting community events. And so we brought together architects and engineers and artists and community leaders and uh, business and residents from the neighborhood uh, and actually gave them the challenge of looking at the particular site and seeing what and how we could not only accomplish the 40 kilowatt uh, array, but actually create it as that iconic entrance to the neighborhood. Because the site is actually going to be um, on I-35, between I-35 and West Michigan Street. So there'll be 60,000 vehicles a day that will see this site. Um, and then it's where the Cross City Trail mm -hmm. is, et cetera. So we really want it uh, to incorporate um, creative placemaking aspects. And we had some sure. great ideas that came out. Mm -hmm. Katie, some folks watching tonight might be wondering, how does solar installation cost compare with perhaps more traditional energy installations? Sure, so um, the costs of solar have come down pretty significantly Are in they? the last couple of years. And when you talk about projects like what Jody's working on where you're installing a larger system, you really do get economies of scale to bring the cost of an array down as opposed to smaller installations. So 
Um, the benefits of kind of doing a larger community array definitely bring the cost down. So we do see, you know, the cost of solar in general is still a little higher than our standard power mix, but it's coming down all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the sun raiser. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we are going to be running a, a community fundraiser event called the sun raiser in which we're asking people from May 23rd to June 21st, so the 30 days before the summer solstice, uh, to try to guess Duluth's weather. Um, and we've got some businesses that are helping sponsor based on correct guesses. Uh, and then we also have a way in which individual community members can, can make a pledge based on uh, their per sunny day. So maybe uh, I'll give $5 for every sunny day during those 30 <laughs> days um, to help support uh, this long-term solution uh, for our community. Sounds like a fun idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and Katie, when would you visualize that the, the Lincoln Park Solar Garden could be up and running? Yeah, so Minnesota Power's involvement with this program is with our low-income solar pilot program, mm -hmm. which ends at the end of this year. It was a three-year program, and 2019 is the last year. So um, we definitely hope to see it up and running sure. by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. All right, sounds good. Katie Fry from Minnesota Power and Jody Slick from Equilibrium 3, thanks so much for coming in. Good luck mm -hmm. with your sunraiser. Thank you. All the best. <laughs> to celebrate the UMD men's hockey team in their second consecutive national championship and just was an amazing run again this year so we just want to take part in the festivities and this is a way to honor them. Well, I've been a Bulldog fan for about 30 years. It turned out to be the best tournament we've had and they played the greatest game I've ever seen them play. It's huge for the boys, the coaches, the school and the whole community. I uh, started attending school at UMD in 1986, kind of like the Minnesota Vikings. I never thought maybe they would win a championship in my lifetime, but they have three now. So I think we're in the midst of a dynasty. The city of Duluth and the entire region has a golden opportunity this fall to become part of a growing creative industry. Duluth will host ITV Fest, which brings together folks who are creating independent programming with industry executives and producers. It's kind of a free marketplace for content creators that has its roots in LA and Vermont, but now is setting up shop in Duluth as its permanent home. And here to tell us more is Philip Gilpin Jr., Executive Director of ITV Fest, and welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So tell people a little bit about uh, the festival and how on earth you landed in Duluth. Sure, yeah, so the, the reason we ended up in Duluth is the TV industry is changing so quickly that a lot of storytellers around the world, they aren't waking up in the morning and writing independent films anymore, they're writing independent series. And a lot of these people are looking for a place mm -hmm. to not just have a festival and showcase what they've made to the industry, but a place to live and work year round mm -hmm. that they can move their families to and shoot TV and film in that maybe isn't as expensive as in LA or sure. New York, but has enough geographical diversity and location diversity that if you write a script that takes place on an ocean setting, you have a large lake you can shoot that on. If you have a script that takes place in a snow setting, you have a winter you can shoot that in. Yeah. You can see where I'm going with this. Duluth's diversity of architecture and locations all within you know, a, a major 30 to 60 minute drive mm -hmm. is incredible. And when we started looking at places across the northern US to set up a long-term home, uh, from the outside perspective, we didn't find any place that was as uh, had as much variety and is as unique as Duluth is. Mm -hmm. uh, your I your infrastructure for the event alone, with the North Shore Theater, the Zeitgeist and Fickers, you know, having a major airport here and the hotels and restaurants. The event component, obviously, Duluth can handle, but it can also handle a lot of year-round production, and those productions. Uh, can bring in a lot of jobs and a lot of money and a lot of opportunity for young kids to get into the industry and a lot of people to, to find some really good full-time employment. So, Philip, what has caused the TV industry to change so dramatically, where now you're going out of Hollywood? Yeah, 
Um, really great question. The, the simple answer is two things. One, if you go all the way back to 2005, uh, YouTube didn't really exist. And if you and I had something we wanted to distribute to the world, we had to still go through the, the industry way. We had to go through the agencies and the networks and the studios. Sure. All of a sudden, in 2006, we all could wake up and just distribute our content to anybody around the world. That's been a huge advantage. The second thing is just the, the increase of affordability of digital technology. Uh, something that used to cost maybe a million dollars to shoot a 60-minute TV show, mm -hmm. can people are now shooting 30 to 60 minute TV shows on 50 to 75 thousand dollars, and here's the big change: the quality of what they're producing is good enough now to take people's eyeballs away from the existing network shows. Mm -hmm. Whereas even as recently as five years ago, we really weren't at a place where people were making programming good enough on those low budgets to take you away from an ABC or an NBC or a CBS sure. show, but they are now. And so the industry needs a place where they can come and find these projects and find these new voices and find these new storytellers. And the, the real key piece about what we are is we are not a film festival. And if you hear anybody talk about there's a film festival coming to Duluth in October, that's not true. There's thousands of film festivals out there and you already have a great one here with the Duluth Superior Film Festival. Mm -hmm. We're a television festival and there are three in the United States that allow independent content. Mm -hmm. That's how unique of an opportunity this is for Duluth. Mm -hmm. What will the festival look like for people in the community and for participants? Is this something where it's really kind of an insider game or no. will, will local folks be able to participate? Will local um, producers be able to show their, mm -hmm. show their ideas or, or their projects to people from the industry? Absolutely. This is not an insider game at all. The mm -hmm. reason we chose Duluth was because of your incredibly strong art scene you already have here. We want to be part of a community year-round that appreciates the arts and has a real thirst for creating new projects and allowing new creators to come into town. Sure. Uh, we like to say that Duluth is now the Iowa caucuses of television. There are going to be people from around the world who are making television shows that they want to get into the networks and the studio system and get out into the world that are going to be bringing them into the Duluth theaters first before the industry's even seen them. And we need Duluthians to come out and support and let us know through their votes and by watching these shows, mm -hmm. which ones they like, which ones are the best. And one of the things that's really unique about us is every show that gets screened, the cast and crew have to physically be here. So yeah. you get to meet everybody. Um, each of these people that are attending the festival from the industry, they represent between a million and $50 million of future projects. They're gonna be shooting somewhere in their life over the next 10 years. Our goal is to have them fall in love with Duluthians and Duluth so they shoot in here. Which raises the question, will they be looking for actors in Duluth? Yes. They will be. Yeah, the, 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 the process with this is if we, we do a really good job as, as a community welcoming this group of people in this industry into town sure. in October, over the next couple of years, as they decide they want to start shooting here, actors, writers, directors, but the big thing that uh, uh, you know people in the TV industry know, but maybe a lot of people who aren't in the industry don't know, is most jobs on a TV production are blue collar labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's union, it's guild, it's industry, it's carpenters and drivers and caterers and, uh, and you know, set designers and costume designers. Those are the types of, of jobs that can come out of this mm -hmm. if those projects. We're out here. of time, but just very quickly, Independent Television Festival, yeah. catchy name, but yeah. I hear that uh, you're thinking about a new a new branding effort. Can yeah. you break it here on our show? Yeah, sure. Wh uh, <laughs> one of the things that started happening over the last few years was we noticed that most people under the age of 25 don't use the word TV anymore when they're talking about the content they watch. They use the word show. And so our board decided that we wanted to go through a branding process. And uh, starting this summer, you're going to start seeing the uh, Catalyst. It's called Catalyst Stories mm -hmm. is coming out. But Catalyst is something that we are, which is we lower that barrier for people around the world to be able to be found by the industry and have their stories break through. All right, we're getting a wrap. Bill okay. Gilpin, we'll have you back this summer, hopefully to hear more about yeah, the absolutely. plans coming together. Appreciate you coming. Thank in. you, Philip. Thank you.
It's time now for the business news from the editors at Business North. The first saltwater ship of the season arrived under the aerial bridge on Monday at 6.48 a.m. The Maria G was the first ship of the season to traverse the now 60-year-old St. Lawrence Seaway. The first ship ceremony, another spring port tradition, followed in the afternoon with official greetings and gifts from local dignitaries. The Maria G will be loaded with 21,000 tons of spring wheat destined for Italy. Duluth Mayor Emily Larson held her annual State of the City address at Myers Wilkins Elementary School Monday night. The mayor began her speech addressing four highlights from 2018-2019. She touted progress on street repairs, local investment and building, the city implementing priority-based budgeting, and the return of neighborhood youth programs. Jobs, child care, housing, energy. These are urgent problems that we can't wait to solve, Mayor Larson noted. Elite Clean Energy has received the 45th set of new wind turbine blades for its refurbishing initiatives at Storm Lake and Lake Benton wind facilities in Minnesota and Iowa. The Elite Division announced an $80 million project in 2017 that includes replacing blades, gearboxes, and generators on turbines. The project will improve performance and reliability, generate federal production tax credits at each site, and support the renewal of power sale agreements at the Storm Lake sites. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment on our show, call now, dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org. And visit the WDSC website for our program schedules, news and updates about the station, and upcoming special events. And, Denny, our congratulations to the UMD Bulldog men's hockey team for their second straight national championship. Wow. It's something to really bark about. Absolutely. Congratulations. What a game. All right. For Denny and the team here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great Easter weekend. We'll see you next time.